almost five past, maybe we should kind of formally start the seminar. Um, welcome to everybody to um, our second, is it the second one, Wayne? I think it's the second history seminar that we have um, this term. Um, um, and thank you, Wayne, for organizing it. And, and thank you to um, Stefania and Lars in particular for um, um, presenting uh, today their work. And maybe just a brief word. In, I mean, in a way, both speakers don't need a lot of introduction, I guess. But um, let's start with Lars, who's been working on uh, religions and um, Christianity in China in particular for a long time. Um, and who is um, now kind of has joined um, Stefania's and I think Elena, Elena's project, right? It's, it's the two of you who are um, kind of leading this project, if I understood that um, correctly. Elena Valus is also present. Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Um, uh, so, okay, you'll know Lars, who is um, who does in the history department, has, has been there for, for quite a few years. Um, and then we have Stefania Travanin, who did uh, her PhD at SOAS quite some time ago by now. I think that was probably shortly after I joined the department here. Um, but uh, she did her PhD in uh, um, religion study, working on uh, Chinese Buddhism in the early 20th century. Um, and um, after that, spent a couple of years um, at the University of Groningen and has then decided that so as is where her heart belongs, <laughs> I believe, um, if I understand your decision right, to, um, to come back uh, to our department um, uh, to um, teach um, Chinese religions, I guess, and philosophy. Um, and that's it's absolutely wonderful to have you here. Um, so maybe in terms of publications, Stefan has mainly worked on Buddhism in, in the 20th century, a lot of aspects of kind of in terms of Buddhist education, Buddhist monastic life, women in Buddhism. Buddhist doctrine to some extent, I think. Um, and I don't know a lot about this new project. It sounds fascinating. It's about um, kind of, I, I did notice down the title somewhere, Mapping Religious Diversity in Modern Sichuan. It sounds fascinating. Yeah, we spent um, just a few minutes actually explaining the project, so don't worry. Okay, yeah, I won't explain a lot about it. Just wanted to say that it's kind of gone around the world. That's where I picked it up, actually, rather than from our department, which is very interesting. Um, um, and uh, I mean, it, it looks terribly promising. It's, it's a huge project with a lot of people involved from kind of working on different aspects of religious life um, in um, in Sichuan. Uh, so I assume that the two of you, Stefania and Elana, probably work on, on, on Buddhist religion. I'm not, not quite sure about Elana Taoist uh, stuff too. And uh, so Lars is working on Catholicism and there's a, a, a long list of other people also involved. So it's a fantastic project. Um, and today, um, uh, Stefania and Lars will be uh, talking about um, bringing the periphery to the center. So very curious what you mean by that, whether it's about Sichuan being in the far west uh, or something else, really. So I will leave the floor to you to explain more what you mean by that. Thank you so much for agreeing to give us this talk. Thank you. So I will share my screen. So you can also see my PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Andrea, for your, uh, gonna, thank you, Andrea, for your very kind um, introduction. Lars and I had this idea to give a short introduction to this project since both of us are actually uh, based at SOAS right now. And, and really would love to take this opportunity to introduce what we have done, what kind of background of the project is and who is involved and also to analyze some case studies. This is a project, it's a multi-year project that started in uh, late 2017 and is founded by the Zhang Jingguo Foundation for International Scholarly Exchange and, of, and is titled Mapping Religious Diversity in Modern Sichuan. Oh. And this is just a screenshot of the website and also you can see the website on the bottom. This is a project that I am directing with Elena Valussi, who is online tonight with us from Loyola University Chicago and also former graduate from SOAS. 
and counts the participation of 12 scholars in total, coming from several disciplinary training. There are historians, people working on history of religion, Chinese studies, anthropology, sociology, ritual studies, media, and material culture, and affiliated to institutions in North America, Europe, and Asia. And, and Lars and I are actually based at SOAS. At the moment, the, the grant per se is also based at SOAS. We collaborate with local scholars in Sichuan, so we have um, quite an extensive network between Sichuan University, Sichuan Normal University, the Southwest University for Nationality, the Chongqing Academy, and so on, and also rely on a large network of religious communities in Sichuan and Chongqing. We started in the end of 2017 and were able to conduct a series of field trips until the end of 2018, and given the current travel uh, restrictions, we have spent most of our 2020 in doing some writing, in checking our notes, but also revising and enriching the website, the project website, the one that you can see here, which I will show you later. The website includes a map of the sites we are working on, a timeline related to the key moments of the history of these sites. And the next step will be adding a visualization of religious networks centered on, centered on particular individuals and, and person religious people that somehow we are discovering throughout our research. In line with the project focus that is on the China Republican period, so from the mid uh, 17th century, but mostly focusing really on the 19th century up to 1950. Um, we also, with also some links to the contemporary situation, the map of the timeline that you can find on the website are meant to provide data of the sites and milestone moments that characterize the modern period. So it's not like a comprehensive history of all the religious sites in Sichuan. We really want to give a visualization of what was happening in those particular decades. For sites, we don't need just, we don't mean just temples. Um, we are looking also at other places that somehow embed religious meaning or had a religious role in their life. So what we do tonight is Lars will start um, providing an overview of the history of Sichuan. Afterwards, I will explain why we decided to focus on the religious landscape of Sichuan and what are our leading question in the project and how we are conducting our research in terms of overarching theoretical framework and research methodologies that we have adopted since the beginning. And at the very end, Lars and I will share some of our foundings, case studies that prove the active participation of religious players in the unfolding of local and national history. We will also review specific sources and methods that we have adopted specifically for those case studies. We will also discuss challenges that we have met in our fieldwork hoping that somehow our, our experience can be helpful to graduate students or to whoever is doing field work in similar situation. So now I will stop the share and we'll leave the word to Lars. Yes, um, thank you very much. I'm going to let you share my screen. Oh, you may see yourselves now. Wait, um, I'll do it the other way around. Um, I, um, I have two screens, I should explain. <laughs> I, it's sometimes uh, an advantage, sometimes a disadvantage. Mm. Here we go. So, okay. Um, and then I just need to have the... Yes, um, I'm going to say a few words now concerning the historical background of um, Sichuan, because that explains in part the title. Um, I have lost everything now, sorry. <laughs> the title is of course to bring the periphery into the center and um, the um, uh, most um, important aspect to remember is that we're in China, but at the same time, we're not in China. And this may seem like a contradiction in terms, but can you see the, um, the screen now, this moment? Here, can, can you see the, ho the whole screen in large? Very good, very good. Yes. So then you're in the center. Um, and of course, being in China means being in the center, but it's the, um, but we have a, a problem with Sichuan because Sichuan um, is um, uh, half in, half out, you could say, um, a bit like Britain and the European Union. But um, in uh, historical terms in China, of course, that matters because um, it brings along the, um, 
specter of warfare, but then also on the positive side, a lot of cultural uh, contacts. And um, uh, in all brevity, I, I just want to take you through 3,000 years of Sichuan history in order to make clear why certain religious traditions matter um, that we have today, and especially Christianity in, from my perspective, Buddhism, of course, from another perspective. Um, what uh, <clears throat> you see here is Li Su language, Sichuan, and this is uh, Tibetan. Both are today extant um, minority groups. Um, uh, there are others, the Jiang, for example, uh, but um, th uh, the, uh, by now the majority of the population are certainly the Han Chinese, uh, around 95%. So it's about the same mix as that you have for the People's Republic in general. Um, historically, um, the uh, province is known as Ba and Shu. So these are two parts which um, you will probably see here on this map, no, you won't see it. <laughs> I showed you on a different map, but it's um, uh, these are two halves which developed um, uh, quite early on in time. Um, the uh, the issue about the periphery should become clear once we enlarge the um, maps. So this is probably the oldest map that we have. This shows you the <clears throat> area where uh, Sichuan is situated today. There's even an insert for, of the global map with Eurasia, People's Republic, and then this part which uh, shows you the, um, uh, not Sichuan, but the area which is highlighted here. Um, but it shows you that it's outside the center. And from uh, a historical perspective, th this does make a difference. Um, these are the states, the warring states, which then become the first China. So it takes some time for Sichuan to be incorporated into China, uh, going, moving across the timeline by about um, 800 years. Um, that's not true. Um, 1200 years, sorry, 1200 years. And um, we arrive in the Tang period, and you can see that this area is still outside China. So this is, although there is a lot of interaction, and although the uh, area is integrated actually into, um, into China, but uh, there are other players at work, especially the neighbors, the large neighbors, namely Tibet. Um, the, um, just to bring the geographical dimension of this being outside and inside, uh, so being on the periphery, being central um, uh, into uh, focus, um, I found this map, which shows very beautifully that this part, which is, uh, which is Sichuan, so Chongqing is here, Chengdu uh, further to the west, um, is actually directly on the border to something that we easily recognize as Tibet. But historically, of course, all of this is Tibet. This is, um, this, these are the Tibetan lowlands. These are the highlands. And then before uh, you know it, you cross the river, the Ch Yangtze River, Changyang, and all of a sudden you're in territory where the Han Chinese are historically not at home. So this is uh, why Sichuan is geographically and historically on the uh, uh, out side of the um, uh, Chinese civilizational spectrum. In terms of civilization, of course, you can see that this is a so-called Sino-Tibetan um, Buddhist um, uh, statuette, which um, shows clear uh, similarities um, uh, to um, at least Cham culture, which is, of course, in um, uh, which you would find in uh, Kampuchea, in the uh, central parts of Vietnam, and then all the way over to India. So this is th this is a part of a different cultural sphere, very much at home in uh, historical Sichuan. Again, a few samples that show you the um, period that precedes the, if you like, the integration of the region into China. These uh, rather mystical looking uh, creatures are bronze figures from a place called San Xindui, which um, is um, uh, uh, part of the early bronze civilizations. And then here in the corner, you have a, uh, I think it's an earthenware one, uh, which um, 
gives you the image of a storyteller, uh, quite vivid if you, if you to look at the uh, figure. And this is already when in um, the um, uh, rest of China, or, and including actually those parts of uh, the eastern parts of uh, Sichuan, you are already in the Han period. So in other words, this is already integrated. But um, uh, this duality uh, still exists. And it's only actually in the um, uh, uh, Song era that uh, Sichuan really becomes fully part of, uh, of, chi um, of, of China. Let's call it China. Um, Song, it's, a, it's a contradiction in terms because Song China is actually the smallest empire of the the, the large uh, con contiguous empires that uh, exist in China, but, uh, but still already then, uh, if that's around uh, uh, in the 11th century, 12th centuries um, of our time, um, you get a, um, a strong Chinese presence in Sichuan. And the gentleman to the right is uh, the um, uh, poet and statesman Su Shi, who is also a famous cook. Um, those of you who have been to Hangzhou, especially, it's far away from uh, uh, from Sichuan, um, you will know that he's experimented with uh, pork. So this is uh, uh, so, so, so this is pork. So, but in any case, um, um, he probably also had vegetarian dishes. But um, but in any case, uh, he did not make uh, uh, any food out of these um, uh, pandas, who are very much at home in Sichuan. Uh, but they, the two had the same idea, namely to use um, a kind of walking stick, uh, which um, I, I think is quite a good idea. And it's quite telling of Sichuan because of course, this is a, an area which um, is uh, also in terms of vegetation quite different from other parts of China. In the late imperial period, and this is where it becomes important for Christianity. And this is, this is actually the, the last uh, point that I want to make for the uh, historical introduction. In the late imperial period, um, it, Sichuan plays an important role. It's um, during the Ming era, so from 1368 all the way till 1644, uh, it continues the very intense integration into the um, uh, rest of uh, cultural China. So in other words, it's part of not just part of the administrative uh, structure, but it's very much part of the uh, cultural trends that uh, occur in China. You get this in the religious realm, philosophical realm, in the um, uh, expression of the um, syncretic movement. So it's the San Jiao He Yi, the three teachings that unite into one. This is uh, this becomes this tendency becomes very strong during the um, Ming period, and it's. Um, in this time that you get also at a popular level, a lot of syncretic movements. And these syncretic movements are initially quite, um, well, they are illicit in any case because the Ming are less concerned with uh, religious uh, organizations being illegal, but um, they certainly form the beginning of the, um, uh, of I won't call them secret societies, but of the, um, religious societies which uh, draw their um, uh, essence out of the um, out of the unification of different religious ideas. Therefore, you get um, from um, you know you have here on the right hand side a um, uh, an early image from the Ming period where you have um, uh, men congregating there or men of, uh, who belong to the so-called Bailian uh, the White Lotus Society. White Lotus were quite um, well innovative in one way, namely that they allowed women full access. So you had men and women meeting in the same uh, places, which during the Ming period was perhaps frowned upon, but not illegal, but definitely during the Qing. And um, this is why during the Qing period, uh, you have regular uh, persecutions against um, uh, sect well, against religious movements, which are declared um, heterodox, heretical, we come across that term at the beginning of my introduction to Christianity. Um, one other feature that's very important for the population and for the entire structure of uh, Sichuan 
um, following the conquest of the Ming Empire by the Qing, so uh, in the first decades after 1644, um, the uh, West, especially the Western parts, well, China was being divided up between the central government and between feudatories in simple, simplifying language. And these feudatories were simply territories that were given to the three great biggest commanders who had helped the, the Qing to conquer the uh, territory of the former Ming Empire. One of them, Wu Sangui, um, extended his uh, feudatory to include Sichuan. And um, though it was not, the period was too short to actually um, have any formal uh, power structures in place, but the warfare that came along uh, had a, a, a dramatic effect on the population of Sichuan, uh, the population was reduced in some places by 90%. And this is um, a um, almost what you could refer to, I think I used the term decimate, so <laughs> it almost left only 10% left, not, com not completely, but in some population centers, certainly. And the um, effect for the following one and a half centuries, so from throughout the whole 18th century, and um, certainly in the first decades of the uh, the 20th century, sorry, 19th century, uh, you had population movements because of a regaining population growth, which meant that people uh, in the countryside were no longer needed, so they went to the big cities. And while many people made their way to the eastern, um, uh, the cities in the east, in the uh, Jiangnan, for example, in the lower Yangtze Valley, uh, Sichuan became one of these uh, places in the interior to absorb people. And because they absorbed many people from Northern China, the dialect which you have in Sichuan is very unique. It is, it is essentially a Northern dialect, but pronounced in a, in a very peculiar way. So this is Sichuanese, um, Chinese. Um, so these were a few words concerning the development of Sichuan as a peripheral part of China that then becomes part of the center. So this is probably a, uh, a fairly um, vague explanation, certainly to historians, but um, uh, I just wanted to highlight the major steps on the development of this province up to the point when Christianity develops. And that will be my following part after uh, Steffi, uh, who will continue with her introduction. Thank you. Click out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Lars. So, how, as um, Lars said, the Sichuan is indeed um, participate very much in um, national history, but also has their own peculiarity. And they have you can find a number of events or movements that are pretty much local. And so there you have a development of a participation in national history and also development of important local movements. The railway protection movement uh, in the modern period is just one of the many examples. Lars gave his own explanation of periphery. I have to say that um, in another sense, from a religious studies perspective, we have noticed how um, there is an emerging um, scholarship on religion in modern China. And somehow most of this scholarship is actually looking at the Jiannan area. So a different uh, regional um, place in China and also focus on coastal areas and large urban centers. While well, actually Sichuan, which is in the periphery, kind of remain also in the periphery of the academic study of Chinese religion. So what we wanted to do is somehow integrate the current scholarship of history of China and religious history of China, exploring dynamics and paradigm of religious diversity in modern Sichuan. Since um, you have a, a national history, so what, what we also want to do is try to engage history and religion. So with this project uh, and the different researches within the project show how uh, this unique historical background might have influenced religious life and institution in modern Sichuan and also vice versa, how religious communities might have intervened or even affected the unfolding of non-religious history within this territory and also in the larger territory of China. And in some of my case studies also intervened in the region in Southeast Asia. 
This project wants to look at Sechuanzo as a place that needs to be relocated from the periphery of the academic study of religion to the center. And it reveals that Sichuan is an important node of religious networks that originate and develop within it and extend beyond it. And is an active center of religious knowledge production in, it, in itself. It's not just the reci recipient of knowledge transmission from more advanced coastal areas. Oh. Now, Within China, the province, the province of Sichuan is very much rich when it comes to uh, ethnic minorities and um, religious diversity. Ethnic minorities, something that Lars already introduced, you have a number of minorities like the Yi, the Miao, the Hui, the Chan, the Zhang, Zhan, so the Tibetan groups, and some of them are um, prominent in particular areas of Sichuan, some others you have particular area that you find more than one minority in there, and this is one of the part of the uniqueness of Sichuan, but it's also crucial for the overall history of religious in China. In fact, you have Taoist, Buddhism, Islam, Catholicism, Protestant Christianity have been coexisting for centuries in here. Just to give um, a short overview, the present Sichuan is in the area where Zhang Taoling uh, founded the Celestial Masters and so started Taoist movements already in the Eastern An. And not much later, actually, this is also one of the very first parts of China that experienced the arrival of spread of Buddhism. To be honest, according to some of my funding, um, looking at some local reading of historical documents, it seems that Buddhist worship was practiced already in the third century BC, in particular area of, of Sichuan, in the city of Suining. Tibetan tradition also was recorded in Sichuan in the imperial time. The Muslim communities start developing the Yuan period and increasing later in the Min and the Qin. Catholicism is present since the Tang, but then in the late Min and early Qin, you have um, a, a really a settle down of Catholic Christianity. And later on in the 19th century of Protestant also joining the Catholics. Moreover, in terms of sacred sites, um, Sichuan has also a number of important places, sacred places for both Taoism and Buddhism. One of the uh, sacred mountains of Buddhism, Ermei, Ermei Shan Mount Ermei is indeed in Sichuan, and the Qinchen Shan, one of the sacred mountains for Taoism, is also in Sichuan. So this is why for us, Sichuan is a unique place, it's a crucial case study to, to see religious and ethnic diversity, to also understand how religious communities, sacred space, religious social networks are all interacting. As the title of our project suggests, we are researching not just religion, but indeed religious diversity. And religious diversity is a topic that has been quite um, emerging, quite prominent recently in a number of study of Western scholarship and, and beyond Western scholarship, and, and, and focusing on, of course, religious diversity in other areas, in other geographical and cultural areas. Most of Western scholarship have shown an increased interest in the topic of governance and dynamics of religious diversity. And of course, uh, failures in the administration of diversity, the confrontation of an increase in exclusion and lack of inclusion practices, all these pressing challenges for our current society have encouraged academic and public debates on the subject. In China, it seems that coexistence and cooperation among the, vari the variety of religious traditions and communities develop in a distinct way. And as it is, it is reflected in the research on local religious diversity that has appeared in the past few years. The preliminary discussion of the subject found its first difficulties in adoption of the word religion and reached the conclusion that both the construct, the construct of religion and the concept of diversity should be problematized and critically redefined in light of the China context. In fact, the issues of affiliation and membership to specific religious groups are conceived peculiarly in the Chinese plurality of belief systems. Since China is on most levels an arena that witnesses borrowings rather than boundaries among religions. Scholarship has argued that coexistence and often also merging and collaboration among religious tradition and diverse communities advance in a distinct way. There have been a number of edited volumes in the last 10 years that actually are focusing on this. Adam Chow, for instance, argued that the concept of religious diversity is not native of Chinese culture, since Chinese people see, see religions not as fixed and impermeable systems of beliefs, but as situation-based practices. And in China, we may see diversity in religiosity and inclusion practices, but we may not really detect the religious diversity and practices of exclusion as they emerge elsewhere. Other scholars have made a distinction between the double perspective of religious diversity as lived in practice, 
on the ground on the one hand, and the one that is theorized in and more rhetorical in China's official policies on the other. Sociologists have added to this discussion, um, discussing the possibility to talk about plurality and pluralism and pluralization instead of diversity, looking also the concept of oligopoly as diversity is read on the level of state religion relations. Political scientists have kind of warned on the use of the term diversity looking at China and, and, and decided to us maybe it was, would have been better to zoom in and look at different uh, realities within China and also made a distinction between what happened in mainland China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. Secularism and secularization are other two terms that somehow emerge from this debate and highly criticized. And then the term syncretism and the term sectarianism have often been used and misused in the study of Chinese religious and culture and should be redefined as well. So you have a number of articles that have even been published recently that somehow understand how Western framed classifications that have been used so far should be actually adopted with cautions by scholars. And increasingly, there is a move towards using indigenous ideas and philosophical concept, which can offer alternatives perspective on and definition of diversity, even though relying solely on them, on Chinese uh, native concept may not be satisfactory either. I myself have published an article two years ago where I tried to reflect on this different position and also do some cross references to foundational concepts and paradigms in traditional Chinese thought and Chinese philosophy with a purpose to propose a rather interdisciplinary and multivocal perspective for future research. So some our project is on religious diversity and of course is interacting with this kind of discussion, academic discussion that is developing also within China. Um, but our project is not so much concerned with official policies so the perspective of diversity from the state, um, even if, of course, uh, one of our researchers actually doing uh, research on the different legal, the, the legal regulation of religion and religious diversity. But we try to look more of analysis of communities and networks, the so-called religion on the ground, um, so the lived religion, and with a specific interest in the interactions between rural and urban, public and private, religious and lay communities, and spaces. Moreover, we take into account not only the five officially recognized religions, the one that I mentioned before in relation to Sichuan, Buddhism, Taoist, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Islam, but also other religious manifestations that do not fit into these neat categories, uh, like Confucian Taoist traditions, philanthropic organizations, new religious movements, spirit writing communities, and so on. And we like to address these different religious groups, not as separate entities, but often in conversation with each other. And we will pay also specific attention to gender relation, relations in these exchanges, since um, in, in the study of religion in China, there is still a big uh, need of more and more um, study of the situation of women, of Ch um, women in Chinese religions. Oh. Of course, we have an attention on Sichuan, and now I'm going to um, discuss with you a little bit some key concepts of lines of historical inquiry that we that are the basis of our research. Given our attention on Sichuan and very often to small areas within the province, for instance, I myself am working on one district in Chengdu or a small, well, a small town in China is still a big town from a European perspective, but um, in, in, in perspective of Chinese town is quite a small town in rural areas. So we really look at small areas within the province, not just the province at large. We categorize our research under the label of local history and microhistory and reflect of the active role played by space in the formation of different typologies of networks. Uh, among scholars, Ginsburg uh, explained how microhistories and the studies of local realities are taken as core agents in the disclosing also of macrohistories and the unwrapping of, in this case, the overarching narratives of religious China. And in fact, we try always to relate what happened to Sichuan and the effect of what is happening to Sichuan on um, the impact of what happened in Sichuan in the larger history of China. Space is also another important term for us. And in our project, space is intended not in the sense of the territory, passive recipient of a living society, but is an active agent in the making of a community and a network. It's not a passive container of lived religions. 
And we have scholars that we have read like Dori Massey, so from geography, but also Lily Kong and Kim Knopf, and they all argued how places have multiple identities. They do not have clearly defined inside and outside. And most importantly, places are processes subject to continuous transformation where society and environment are all closely related. And our research show that space and communities alternate each other as subject and object in the power dynamics of a religious and social land landscape. Concepts of micro and local history and a renewed understanding and revit revitalization of ideas of space and place have formed part of the overall theoretical basis of this project. Another term that we use very often is network and the idea of network in relation to community. Network for us function as an analytical tool in the analysis not only of the synchronous relations among religious communities in Sichuan, but also of a diachronic development. Our starting point is that the plurality of religious and cultural traditions in Sichuan has been practiced by religious community, which can be grouped into larger networks. We have considered existing concepts um, that have been developed in network studies, but we also added other concepts like intra-religious network and inter-religious network. And so interact even further with spatial science. Intra-religious network, um, by that we mean a network of communities belonging to the same religious tradition, but maybe located in different areas within Sichuan. While inter-religious network is identified with a network of communities belonging to different religious traditions, but located within a small, it's, it's the same small area, like a city district in Sichuan. The individual projects um, that are um, ongoing, the 12 individual projects, reveal the importance of intra and inter-religious networks and also the text ritual spaces and material culture which result from these interactions. The studies take as a whole, begin to trace the profile of a complex and unique religious landscape influenced by migration, ethnic diversity, and the lack of strong political control that allow for wider experimentation. A few sub-projects sub um, show attention to the role of women in religious community. Religious identity is seen often as interacting and even overlapping with ethnic distinction. In fact, some of the sub-projects develop a discussion of religious diversity in dialogue with the discourse of ethnicity. Attention to spirit writing networks is also part of, of one of the uh, sub-projects. Maps of lineage networks, namely lineage, lineages of teacher-student connection called transmission lineages within Tibetan Buddhism is another topic. Networks in representation is something else that uh, one of us is looking at. Networks in representation means networks as shaped in various forms of literature and material culture, which also engage with networks on the ground. And then there are the consideration of hybrid networks within Sichuan and studies of relation and tension between regional and trans-regional networks, which put Sichuan in dialogue with practices and networks in Zhejiang, Hupei, Guangdong, Jiangsu, Guizhou, and Yunnan. Here I have the list of all the scholars that are involved. And Emmy um, Holmes from DARPA is looking at the uh, networks in representations and also, and specifically Tibetan Buddhism, Hu Jie Chen, who is with, with us today, is looking at the Wenchan uh, worship within Sichuan, but also in relation to other areas, so somehow connected Sichuan to other provinces in China. Jeff Kyung McLean is looking at Protestants uh, in Sichuan, Lars is looking at Catholics and, and is gonna tell us a little bit more later on. Uh, Volker Olles um, is from Sichuan University is looking at uh, Liu Men and some Taoist and also Taoist um, groups. Annabella Pitkin is working on Tibetan Buddhism within Sichuan. I look at Han Buddhism, so I don't look at Sino-Tibetan practices, but more the Chinese side of Buddhism. Tsai Yuan Lin is a scholar that focus on um, on, on the Hui, and so on the, uh, of the diffusion, the spread of Islam within uh, Sichuan, but also looking at Xi'an and, and Guizhou and other area, and so the connection between the Islamic communities in Sichuan and other areas surrounding Sichuan. Elena Balusi, who is the co-director of the project, is also um, with us tonight. Uh, she has um, different projects. One is about women in Taoism and, and, and women as writers also of, of particular text uh, within Taoism and the, um, the history of Huayguan, um, particularly the guide holes. So this particular um, 
buildings um, complex that change religious affiliation throughout history. And so it's a, give a particular, very nice in interpretation of diversity within the same space, uh, diachronically, but also synchronically is um, developing a very interesting conclusion on the role of space in defining um, religious and the particular religious color. And Elena will give a talk on one of his quake one on the 19th of February. Wang Jian Chuan and focused on the spirit writing movement. Wu Hua is our scholar from Sichuan University that is looking at the legal framework of the religious groups, especially Buddhist, but also other religious groups within Sichuan. And Zhang Chongfu also from Sichuan University is looking at uh, Chuan Zhu, so a particular deity related to Sichuan. I'd love to show you for a second our website. Um, I don't know how I can do that. Okay. Can you see the website? Yes. Okay. Um, so on the website, you can read more about the individual projects, the publication and presentation that we are doing about it, um, the profile of the researchers and our fieldwork notes. So um, different notes and kind of blog posts that we write about our field trips, uh, which is last one was in the end of 2018. Uh, what I wanna show you is the map that can um, so this is one of the two uh, major additions that we have done and something that we have worked on during COVID travel restriction was try to create a map where we are locating all the different uh, sites. Um, and if you click on one of them, oh, now I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to do. Okay, here is back. Uh, you can hear the name of the site and, and some more detail and the name of a researcher. And from here, you can go to have a, a more uh, detailed description of this particular site. And as you can see, uh, there are over here on the bottom resource and explanation of how we work on the map. And so far there are some, we are still working on it. So this is um, updated at the end of every month. And besides, as I said, besides the normal Buddhist, for instance, Buddhist temple, there are also schools where schools that were founded, established by monks, but also schools uh, for monks, the schools for monks were established for the laity. And we're gonna do the same for Taoist and, and other religious tradition. So more colors will appear over here. And now if I can go back. The other feature is that it takes a few seconds to load is the timeline where you have all the different um, sites that we have been working on. Again, this is also uh, up updated every at the end of every month. And if you go through here, so we start again, this is not the history of all the religious sites in Sichuan, we are looking at the modern history. So we chose some key uh, moments in the modern history of these sites and we include that in the um, in, in the timeline. And when you go on one of them, again, you have a different explanation and a photo, and then you can move to more details about this particular temple uh, in this case. And, and each line, uh, one line per each tradition, and this will be, will, we will we'll grow even more. Now we'll go back to my PowerPoint. Now, uh, Lars and I would like to close with some ideas of case studies that we have been working on. So you can see more um, in, in practice, what is the, the uniqueness of uh, religious diversity, diversity in Sichuan. I myself have been working on, um, on Han Buddhism, so not the Tibetan or Sino-Tibetan practices. And also within Han Buddhism, I prefer not to look at the, um, the monks and nuns, the so-called eminent monks, eminent nuns, and the, the temples that somehow are mentioned sometimes in historical works um, by Chinese or Western scholars, but try to look at the small sites, uh, small temples, um, and so-called non-eminent monks to so try to give more visibility to a reality that otherwise would be hidden in history. These are just some examples of 
um, of what I've been working on. So a number of papers that I've done on, on nuns or education, or I took particular town like Suenin and Ajan that in perspective in, if you think about China are considered not really big town, big cities. Um, but what I'm gonna talk, since I already talked about nuns in the lecture last year at SOAS, what I'm gonna talk to you today is um, the phenomenon of the, 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 the movement of soldier monks and the engagement between Buddhist monks, temples, and the army during the Sino-Japanese War. So from the 1930s until 1945. I also, before going into detail on, on monks, the army, and the temples, I'm gonna give you an idea of what kind of sources we can look at. And I'm pretty sure that Lars um, my sources and last sources may overlap, but also each of us has peculiar, um, unusual sources that we uh, decided to rely on. In terms of sources, of course, you have the usual uh, official sources on Buddhism, the gazetteers of temples and um, or the gazetteers of particular town and archives of different of provincial archives, town archives, the archives, in my case, of the China of the Buddhist Association of China. And, and then this is the kind of the official documents. But other, there are other material forms and material sources that can give us very important understanding of Qin and Republic, the Qin period and the Republican period in Sichuan. Besides reading a number of novels of novelists that have actually been based in Sichuan and their novels may refer to historical moments and also to nunneries or monasteries in, um, in, in modern Sichuan and a number of interviews to old monks, um, but also uh, younger generation and their memories that have been memorialized um, particular monks and nuns. I relied on pictures that I found in monasteries, museums, and streets. So there is this a very interesting collection that I found um, like a few years ago that give a history and the explanation of the names of the different, street, different streets within the city of Chengdu. This is just Chengdu and there are like four volumes. And some of these streets do have connection with religion. So there is the Monk Road, for instance, and there is a reason why it's called Monk Road. And then this is a photo, and a very, an historical photo, and, and, some, and, and some quotation for that book. But if you go around Chengdu, you can find more and more streets that with the name of particular temples of nunneries. And these temples of nunneries are not there anymore. So from the street, you can actually realize the previous religious map that you have in the city of Chengdu. Streets or a bridge. So this is a bridge. Uh, the bridge is actually on, on, on the side. And you see this, um, this big stone is, is written Shijia Chao, so Shakyamuni Bridge, Shakyamuni, um, the, the Shakyamuni Buddha. This bridge was built in 1918 uh, by a Buddhist monk that never appears in the official history of modern Chinese Buddhism, uh, neither in the Chinese ones nor in the, um, the few English ones. Um, but he was very important for this very, very small community. It's, this is a P2 district. It was called just P, so P Xian in the Republican period. He fundraised for um, the building of this, temple, of, this, of this bridge that actually changed really the life of the community. And to honor that, the community decided to name the bridge uh, on Shakyamuni, so on Buddhism, just as a way to remember this particular monk. And many people, just common people in this, in this very small part of Chengdu, do have memories of the no stories about this particular monk, the monk Chang Yuan. So this is another example of how particular material evidences can give us uh, very, very interesting data of um, religious history in, 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 in this case, the city of Chengdu, but also other areas. When it talks about pictures and picture histories, nunneries, especially nunneries that don't really have a very long written history, they try to memorialize their own history through a collection of photos of the nuns that lived in that monastery. And, but not just nuns, so this is one, ex um, a couple of examples from Chengdu, and then this is, as you see, a number of photos from Neijan, this is another one also from Chengdu, but what you find here are not just nuns, that lived in that nunnery, but also nuns that lived in other nunneries. And, and then, but then they made a trip here and will stay here and somehow the nunnery felt connection with them. 
So through this room, you can have really an idea of a community that is found around this particular nunnery and goes beyond the borders of the same nunnery. And so this is another way to disclose particular networks and communi community networks. So this, this is just an idea of alternative sources that are using to, um, to find information about nuns, monks, but also to find information of the topic of today, the one about uh, soldier monks and the relationship between Buddhism, Buddhist temples and the army. We have um, sources, publications on state protection Buddhism, Buddhism who was called Buddhism to protect the country. And this is something that is pretty much relate uh, and associate this movement to a particular historical moment, the modernity in China, and also the idea of the Buddhism that needs to be helpful, socially helpful in a particular historical moment. Even if the idea of who or protect or protection of Buddhist protection for, for for China is something that you find also in the pre-modern period. There is a very nice publication by Xue Yu about Buddhism war and nationalism already for a few years ago. Um, but what I, um, what I try to do is try to integrate that with a specific study of Sichuan and especially a study of two temples, Wen Shuyuan and, and, and Pao Guan, uh, Pao Guan in Chengdu, and the kind of activities and the relationship between those monks, the monks who lived in those monasteries, and particular generals. Among the sources um, that I found, just to give an idea of um, when we talk about the, the connection between monks, temples, and the army, it's not something that is hidden in the public domain, but this is quite praised by um, the government, by society, and it's also praised rather than hidden in public spaces or in monasteries. This is um, um, a, a sign that um, um, to commemorate uh, the end of the war uh, with the Japanese, and that is something that I found in Zhao Jue Si Temple in Chengdu in 2015. Um, something very important for me for this particular study was a museum. Uh, so besides the usual documents and other material form of material culture, I visited the Sichuan Museum of Jianchuan that is in a very small town on Anren and is made of different buildings and is an impressive exhibition of memories and relics for the second um, Sino-Japanese war with special rooms that explains major events and actors in Sichuan. Going through the different buildings of a museum, it's not difficult to find photos also of Buddhist monks and temples, and also summaries that explain the engagement between Buddhists and the army. So we have this photo that are Buddhist monks in the late 30s uh, in Wenshuyuan, uh, dressed like, these are monks, dressed like soldiers like, that just finished and graduated from a training, a rescue aid training course that was organized in this temple or monks and nuns that were shewing military uniforms. So it was always the idea that the decision at that time that, million, that monks, Buddhists, have to, have to contribute to the Sino-Japanese war. They were, they were not, uh, could not be obliged to kill, and so to be on the front and, and to fight. Um, if they wanted, they could. Then I can tell you, I found a number of autobiographies of monks that praised themselves for killing Japanese. But then you have also monks that decided to help the army in a different, more peaceful way. And these are two examples. You have also mentioned of other monks like Tan Xu, um, who was in a kind of good terms with Japanese and so was able to get the head of a particular general that was killed by the Japanese to head it back from the Japanese and he kept it in his temple and was found uh, decades after that. And this is, there was a huge poster about this. So, uh, even at the time, I tried to cut a little bit. Then the, another very interesting uh, relationship between selective Buddhist and, um, and the army are Buddh particular Buddhist monks were very much praised and kept in high uh, consideration by members of the army, but also high members of the Communist Party or of the KMT. Um, and because those years, the particular years in China in general, um, because you have a Sino-Japanese war, but also you have the rising of the power and to power of the, uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. When it comes to Sichuan, it's another peculiar case because the government moved from Nanjing to Chongqing and you have a number of uh, academy, like the Army Academy, that build kind of second headquarters and more schools within Sichuan where the government was. And then there was one particular monk for instance, Nenhai, that is probably the most famous monk. And it comes from um, Sichuan, the one with a number of articles about. 
who was in very good terms with the communists and was able to uh, help a general to pass from the KMT army to the communist army. So this is another example. What I'm going to show you now, uh, what I'm going to explain you um, um, in, 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 uh, in, in briefly, are uh, participation of Buddhist in, um, in the conflict or in contributing to the conflict and also the role of temples. So on the one hand, you have Buddhists uh, participating in it somehow, and then you have all the temples. So the role of space, the space has also been used and contributed uh, to the Sino-Japanese war. In terms of activities you have uh, of Buddhists, you have a training um, medical rescue teams training that was done um, different classes and different training seminars done in different monastery. The major one was done in 1938 um, in Wen Shuyuan, one of his two temples in, in Chengdu, and Pao Guan Si is the one that organized one in 1940. So you have 70, uh, 70, 70 monks uh, from different temples that went to the first one and 60 they went to the second one and we were lasting a little bit more than two months. There was a decision of the Sichuan chapter of the Buddhist Association of China to organize this, um, this training so the monks could have been help, um, helpful and could help the wounded uh, instead. So that, that, that was going to be their own contribution to the war instead of having their own gun and, and, and joining the army in a different, more violent way. There was a number of um, fundraising activities that I found through different documents. In 1941, there was the Buddhist aircraft donation campaign, and that's the one that the way that I could translate it better. It was a fundraising committee established within the Wenshu Monastery and with monks uh, part of it, and they were getting um, funds to um, to help the building of more aircraft for um, planes for the war. In 44 you have another collection of funds that was a more social um, done by society, but the meetings and the general meetings for the collection of these funding of, of, of these funds were done within monastery. And you have monastery were donating more than uh, 44,000 yuan that is at that time was a quite uh, a generous donation. And in the summer of 44, you have um, armies, militaries that were coming back to Sichuan from the front and monks that decide to donate all the pilaf, uh, monks from Wen Shu Yuan that decides to donate all the pilaf, the meditation pilaf to them to make them sleep better and then decided to sleep without the pilaf. So there are all these test and all these um, different documents and then they all end say how um, patriotic the monks, the Buddhist, Buddhist monks and Buddhist nuns were, not less than non-ordained and non-Buddhist people in society. Also interesting are the anti-Japanese war propaganda. So you have a number of propaganda conferences and manifesto that were, um, so the manifestos were written by student monks of a Kunlin Buddhist college, at, for example, in 1931. Then you have a number of pamphlets that were distributed in the thirties um, around the city of Chengdu. So there's been a conference about the anti-Japanese propaganda run by the Sichuan Buddhist Association and important monks, important for Sichuan, um, were part of this conference and then they distribute these anti-Japanese pamphlets to the public. And then you have a number of student monks from the seminary over there that were going street by street, um, speaking against Japanese and giving these pamphlets to everyone. Important also, there was the, the so-called state protection liturgies, the different fahui, the different liturgies that were used to protect the state and to and, and for the victims of war. And these are um, too many to be listed um, from the 1930s up to the end of the war. And some of them have the participation of more than 100 monks and they lasted also a few days. They were either the hugos or the uh, liturgies for the protection of the state. Sometimes they were named uh, Guanin liturgies of the waterland, the Shuelu Fahui, and they were all centered around the recitation of the Humane King Sutra. This is a sutra that talks about the virtues for a humane king. Um, so an apocryphal text that is very important in China in pre-modern time and, 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 and is still read in certain monastery. What is also interesting here, um, this is a, a site, this is a Pao Guan monastery that I mentioned before, and this particular sign, Ai Guo Ai Jiao, it means 
um, love your country and love your religion is, is, is written in every temple, uh, but in this temple is quite important thinking of the role the Pagans uh, had in the organization of training for the soldiers, rescue team training, and also in to be used, really the use of a space within the temple. Something that also was happening at that time, thinking of state protection Buddhism, was the opening, the, the foundation, the establishment of different temples were really called state protection temple. Um, um, so temples that were built and, and all the liturgy that were done there were, was for the welfare and, and the good fortune of the country, especially during the Sino-Japanese war. But then the space. So another very interesting part is you don't have only Buddhist monks participating uh, in, in, in the war in peaceful or less peaceful ways, but also you have temples donating their own space. Um, and you have temples turning into, into military camps. So Pao Huan Si in Chengdu became a military camp. And these photos that you see are kind of peculiar because they come from big posters that you can find inside Pao Huan Si. So Pao Huan Si is very proud to show pictures, historical pictures, and that show how Pao Huan Si was patriotic and contributing to the war at that time. So hosting troops, in this case, hosting rescue, uh, Sangha rescue team training as well. Monks were giving lectures to, um, to the soldiers, uh, lectures about uh, yoga chara schools, a kind of Buddhist psychology, the, the law of karma, the Pure Land Sutra. So normal, uh, let's say, Buddhist lectures, but also doing meditation retreats with the soldiers. They, um, this presence of Buddhists within society is, it was not really unusual. By the time you have the same monks going to prisons, for, uh, for instance, and giving particular ethical teachings to, um, to the inmates, because according to local government, uh, Buddhist monks were able, could give a very uh, positive contribution um, to, uh, to the improvement of the behavior of the inmates. This is another example of things that were happening at that time. And so here you have all these pictures that I took from those posters. And of course, Pao Guan Si is not the only temple that did that. You have uh, Cao Tan Si and also uh, Qin Yang Gong, so also Taoist temples were giving parts of their own, uh, of, of their own premises for that. Um, and here I connect a little bit with Lars because to show how patriotic and how impressive um, the use of a temple space and the impression that that gave to the population, you have important uh, militaries like Fong um, Yuxian, which is a Christian military uh, that wrote, uh, even if he was Christian, but then he visited and stayed in Pao Guangzi and he wrote uh, very nice verses for Pao Guangzi. Of course, this relationship between space, uh, army, and monks is something that also developed before and after the conflict, where you have army offering financial support to the temples. You have a, num a number of militaries that then decide to become monks, for instance, after uh, the war. And then you have temples that stay. So temples are not just military camps, may also be a refugee, a refuge for particular generals. And this is Jude, the stay in Zhao Zhue Si, and then leave this particular sign. And, and then and you have a number of explanation about that. Um, I can go ahead, but I think I want to leave some space also to Lars. So I will close here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think in order to, well, thank you for an incredibly interesting introduction and case study. Um, I'm to preserve time for the um, discussion. I'm going to keep myself as short as possible. In fact, um, let me just see whether I can... Um, <clears throat> Here we go. Over to this one. Yes. No. <laughs> I don't know what you can see. Can you see the um, the um, <clears throat> outline that where I stopped with Usangui and the White Lotus Society? Yes. Okay. I I, I just want to pick up uh, a few points which uh, you mentioned, Steffi, uh, in your talk, and say how this is relevant to Christianity. And then we, we can uh, move on to the discussion because uh, that, that, like this, we can, we can bring different uh, aspects together. Um, so uh, periphery center. So how is um, what you said about uh, uh, Sichuan's special status, if you like, also relevant to Christianity? Well, partly talking about these uh, religious societies, 
um, because the Christianity in Sichuan really spread as a um, as an effect from the outside, namely from the big cities in um, let's call them in inland China and uh, in Beijing, in uh, in the Jiangnan and uh, further up the river, um, and the people who spread Christianity were mostly Chinese Christians themselves. Um, Sichuan is special because it has no ancient Christian roots. So it's, um, it's very different from uh, uh, other parts, the more central parts, northern parts, where you had um, uh, Sogdians who arrived uh, as uh, Nestorians, for example. So uh, what, you, what you get instead is uh, a proliferation of Christian activity during a time when Christian missionary activity was actually proscribed, um, namely the 18th century. And um, in this period, the, um, uh, it was a freestanding vicariate. So it was not, um, not, not actually part of the, the main Chinese vicariates. Um, there were others, uh, Fujian, uh, Shanxi as well, but, uh, but uh, this was more or less independent. And also it was not administered uh, on behalf of the Catholic Church by the propaganda, by the propaganda fide, so the world mission for the Catholic uh, Church, but by the French, by the missions étrangères. And um, I'll just uh, show you a, a, a slide which uh, shows their logo here, Missions Etrangères. Uh, they have a very nice place in, um, in uh, Paris, um, um, Rue du Bac, you go across the, uh, the, the, the Seine and you have a wonderful, um, uh, slightly messy, but beautiful um, um, uh, archive there, which has uh, absolutely everything about their activity and their main activity, keep, the first map in in mind. So this one that I showed you here. The the this is uh, this is Sichuan. This is Yunnan. This is the northern parts of uh, uh, Tonkin, which are not actually part. They 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 belong to the the Spanish missionaries more or less. Uh, but everything here in the center, and then also the northern parts of Mian uh, uh, What is it called? Burma. Yes. Um. Th that is part of the. Uh, early activity of the, um, the, um, uh, the Paris-based missionaries. And um, the uh, important thing is the, the difference that it makes is because they come so late and because they're relatively few in number, the um, development of Christianity in, um, uh, in uh, Sichuan is almost autonomous. There are, of course, um, uh, missionaries, French missionaries, uh, Moy, Portier, um, others as well that come later. But um, the most important aspect is that you have uh, people like uh, Wu Shang, uh, who is um, uh, a, um, what would you call him? He's a serial convert. He starts off with the Qing uh, Shui Jiao. Qing Shui Jiao is the, uh, the, the clear water sect. If you like, it's a fasting, it's a Buddhist fasting sect. And then um, he, he joins the uh, Bai Lianjiao, the official one, the, uh, the, the White Lotus Society. And then after some time, he becomes um, a complete firebrand for Christianity. And he preaches and preaches uh, hellfire, basically. And so the uh, local Christians who convert because of him, they call the sect the, uh, the king of hell sect. That's the, that's the development of Christianity. So it basically develops to an to a considerable extent without European influence. Um, then the second point that I want to mention, and um, this is all a part of the archival research that I did already earlier in Paris, in Rome as well, the propaganda in um, uh, archives throughout China, but of course also in Sichuan, um, are these um, the Zhen Yu, the, um, the, the chaste women, chaste girls, Beatas Virgines, they're, they're referred to in Latin, so the, 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 the blissful um, uh, virgins. Uh, and um, uh, th this is um, a term which is a bit misleading because often they ran away from uh, arranged marriages and um, uh, they, they found refuge in um, uh, homes where they um, then became uh, uh, converts, often, not always, uh, and uh, they began to um, uh, work as catechists. So they, they began to proselytize uh, themselves amongst uh, women. Um, again, no European influence. Later, the, 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 the MEP tries to take it under its wing, 
um, and they found an institute, they have minimum age rules and so on, but, uh, but, but in fact, uh, it's very much an autochthonous um, movement. Um, so uh, and then finally here, that's what I wanted to say, the, um, that during the long 18th century, so up to, up to the point when uh, Western missionaries can actually enter China legally, 1857, 1858, um, that uh, during that time, uh, the Christian population in uh, Sichuan explodes, and they are later realized, uh, sorry, recognized by um, the Western missionaries who arrive as the so-called old Christians, and some try to correct their beliefs or to reconvert them, if you like. So let, let, let's, oh, sorry, J just a few words here. This actually quickly uh, summed up. Um, First attempt is already um, while Western missionaries are still illegal. 1803, you have the Sichuan Synod, which is uh, has some token uh, representation by Dufres, I think, um, a, an MEP uh, uh, missionary, but it's completely um, run by the local Christians um, and um, the uh, mainly to regulate uh, baptisms, marriages. Um, for, for that, I have many examples, but. Uh, Let's move on. So um, it, the Protestants do enter, but uh, in very weak numbers, and also uh, as a um, more or less by default, because they travel up the uh, Changyang, the the Yangtze River, and importantly, they do so. Last point here, uh, as a consequence of the warfare, uh, where uh, the capital uh, Nanjing then later Wuhan falls into the hands of the, um, the, the enemies of the nationalists. So they move to Chongqing and with them, they take many of the Western missionaries. That's the first time that you actually have a real influx of Protestant missionaries. And they, that's above, they uh, devote themselves to missionary work amongst non-Han communities. Uh, that, of course, that starts earlier, Samuel Thompson, um, um, Sorry, <laughs> it'll come back. So, um, uh, the, the, the work amongst the Miao, for example, uh, is, is a very important um, uh, element here. And, um, and here you have, of course, a, um, uh, the belief that uh, if you spread Christianity beyond the, the Han Chinese themselves, you actually begin uh, to take the, uh, you know, the mission to all the people, all the peoples. Um, uh, very seriously. So uh, just uh, a map. I mean, th this is recorded, so uh, you'll be able to, to look at these maps uh, in detail. Um, there's a map here hiding here. Qing maps try to enlarge this. This is part of an ongoing project in, um, uh, based in Leiden. It's the, um, uh, it's, they collab collaborate with SOAS. So um, we're trying to populate this map. Came out of a Manchu exercise. So this is a uh, very different. Um, but um, there are also Manchus here. There, there's a Manchu garrison to the, um, uh, oh, this is Chongqing to the, to the west of uh, Chengdu. So there are also Manchu documents uh, that, that you can look at. And then um, uh, finally, um, my own work ba uh, centered on, and here I am not sure whether I can actually do that. I just, I'm going to stop here, leaders. I'm going to stop in a second. Um, sorry, <laughs> here, maybe you can see it here. This is the, um, just to the north of Chongqing, you have a, um, a, a small city uh, with the name Ba, uh, the Ba district, and that left behind an enormous um, uh, archive, which is completely intact. And it's one of the best uh, preserved archives when it comes to Christianity. And um, final, um, slide, uh, just sorry for rushing through, but this is, uh, uh, this is uh, some of the work that I managed to find when I was there in, we were there in 2019, no, that's uh, summer 2019, that's two years ago, <laughs> that's, um, um, that, that was the, um, um, these are examples of, uh, uh, of work, uh, Ba Xian, you see that here, Chongqing Fu, Ba Xian, um, here, another one which uh, is located, not, which, this, this one has been digitized, not digitized, but has been microfilmed. So you can you can look at the microfilms and then make printouts. But actually, um, something that only exists in print and in the originals is the Nanbu archives. Um, that's another 
area. And you have several of these. Uh, th this one, Nambu Archives, Nambu Dangang one is uh, available in, uh, um, um, I think it's called Sichuan Shufan That's uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But there are similar collections elsewhere. Uh, uh, oh yeah, J just one uh, quote, which I found actually, uh, um, I, I found it twice. I found it first in the Bashan <laughs> collections and then uh, translated and then um, uh, and then also in, but before that, uh, also in, in Paris. Um, there is an absence of outward signs of communal practice. That's what he says in 1805. Um, no church buildings, clerical organizations, or visible crucifixes or scriptures. So this is all underground. It's an underground Christian community. I stop here. I open the floor to discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Lars and Stefania. And I'm so sorry, my, my connection it was interrupted a couple of times, so I missed bits and pieces. I, I just said earlier to Lars, I believe there will be tons of questions. <laughs> um, and, and maybe we can have a few given um, that it's already quite late. So, so I, I guess my, my question was, Stefania, I was very much interested in what you said at the beginning. Sorry if I may ask with a, start, start with a question. Um, this kind of different concepts um, when you were talking about diversity. Um, so what kind of concepts would um, your Chinese colleagues or, or Chinese researchers working in the area use to describe this? Obviously, I mean, you talk about a plurality of religions, kind of the practice of this kind of situational, lo local, lo locational religious practice. Um, but obviously, there are different kinds of religion. So, for example, when Lars talks about Catholicism, it's quite a different thing from practicing um, uh, Taoist rituals or... or um, worshipping um, Pusa or these different things, right? I mean, there's, religion is not the same as religion, I guess. So, so what, what would Chinese concepts be that um, your Chinese colleagues might want to use and what are the difficulties there? I think that's probably my most important question, but maybe we can have a few more um, while you're trying. I, I, I don't know if you would like to answer first and we collect more questions then maybe we can do that and i'm, I'm watching out for um shows of hands well there are different ways um, okay. there are different ways to look at um diversity well first of all you need to think it you need to consider what kind of level you're looking at you're looking at diversity from the perspective of the common people or so that they and the common people that can go to different temples. Uh, they may be Buddhist, but also go to the Taoist temple and may be okay in having a, a, a Bible at home, for instance. Then there is another level that are the religious personnel. So maybe Buddhist monks or Taoist monks. And then you have different understanding of the relationship between different groups. There are, uh, of course, there are certain um, religious personnel that is quite happy in having uh, activities together other than want to make a big distinction between we are Buddhist and they are not. And, and I can, can speak more about from a Buddhist perspective of the religious personnel. Then you have a government and the government is creating a very clear cut distinction, even if they may not say that, but between what is one particular what one particular tradition can do or what other particular tradition may not do. So it really depends when you discuss diversity, which level of, of um, actors you're looking at. You're looking at the government or the monastic communities or the, uh, the strict practitioner or the common people. Um, certainly something that it seems that more than um, also depends on the case study, um, but there are particular areas where uh, you go to some temples and you find more than, so you may connect one particular deity with another bodhisattva. So already within a thing, within a site or within a community, you find the connection between important divine figures belonging to different faith. And then it's an, a way to show or to, to understand in the minds of practitioner, the uh, connection and um, the har harmoni uh, harmonic connection between different beliefs. In terms of if you're looking at terms, um, and, and, well, the, you can either do a very transliteration from diversity, but very often speaking in metaphors, uh, there are a number of metaphors looking at diversity as form of richness or as a richness that um, a diversity that is integrating the unity. So for instance, the example of inner yang is being used very often 
or the concept, this kind of dual concepts like Tia Young, so the, the body and then the function of other beliefs, so one belief more central and other beliefs that are um, around it. So it really depends on what kind of community and what kind of people you're looking at. So there are a number of particular terms that can be used. But many of us, and that, well, I've been working more on the within Buddhist uh, so far. So I've not I started just the project on, and then there was COVID, on all the different religious beliefs and, and the different sites and communities within a particular district. Um, but my understanding is the space may become more important than the, the, than the boundaries between religious places, um, between religious, religious beliefs. So, so a space can actually create a venue for different faith to be harmonized together. Um, I, that's another example. There are particular spaces that can host more than one belief at the same time or in different historical period. Um, so there are different ways to see this overlapping of, of faith. I don't know if I answer your question or I add more confusion. I'm just thinking about it. It's not confusion. I'm just interested. I mean, when you say it's, it's the richness, so that's probably the way to express what you mean by diversity. But from the way you've presented it, also thinking about the different kinds of religious practices that, that you will encounter. There are also hierarchies involved and there, there is... Um, religions that or kind of religious practices that fit better within the official framework what is what is um, welcome and fine and and then there are others that um, I mean in using Lars's works um, uh, words might be considered as more heretical and the Catholic Church is certainly would belong to those I would expect so I mean it's I, I, we, we can't probably go into that kind, but it's, it's the, the terminology that's used that, that I think is quite interesting how you conceptualize these things, because that's an, I mean, it's an issue I'm personally interested in. That's why I was asking this question. But I would like to leave a bit time for others. I, I've seen, I think, Silping first, if I did get this right, and then Elena. All right. Hello there. Long time no see for most of you. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Uh, Really, really thanks for this presentation. <laughs> and uh, it's another just topic which I'm really interested about. And my question is about the map uh, which had been showed. And uh, we can see that you uh, had dedicated, select a lot of different buildings which you think is related with the, uh, uh, with the local religion. And you catalog them in the different, uh, according to their uh, background in religions like the Buddhist building, Taoist building, and so on. But actually, uh, my question is, what is your standard to choose those buildings? Whether they were built as a temple and then you choose it as a, as a I mean, like a, the building which related to the uh, uh, Buddhism, or you also choose a building which may not uh, is may not be a temple, but still host the uh, re uh, relevant practice, because what I think, uh, I'm, because what uh, is really common in North China is there's a lot of underground uh, Christian communities, and uh, their religious practice is not really host in the church, but in somewhere else. I just wonder, within uh, your selections of the religious buildings. Would you consider this kind of you know, official building was a kind of religious building? Or uh, is your collection of the buildings including this kind of locations or places? This is my question. Thanks. To who? Well, I can, I can say something. Elena can jump in if she wants, um, because she was also involved with a map. It's a very it's a very good question. Um, first of all, we have been um, brainstorming on how to create a legend and also because this idea of religious affiliation is can be very blurry in certain cases. And in fact, especially with some um, elements and some buildings that Elena is dealing with, uh, the Hui Guang, then we call it hybrid, I think, as a way to define that they're changing of religious affiliation and role within history. We are not looking just at temples. First of all, we're not looking at all the temples in the history of Sichuan and not all the temples of today, 
because a number of those temples are not present anymore. Temples or sites are not present anymore, but they were very relevant in the Qin and Republican period. And are not just temples or, or nunneries or, um, for instance, um, there were also Buddhist societies or gathering of people that were located somewhere, but were also itinerant. So, but around the particular district. So somehow we found a way also to map those. So it's, it's also mapping group of communities and not just the tem a, a temple like a building where we are not just looking at that. And of course, what we have seen so far is a selection of what we have studied. So we are documenting temples that are studied in our own research. So myself, I've been working on community in Sweden, uh, Neijan, Nanchon, Chongqing, and some areas of Chengdu and Luzhou also, yes. Um, so that's why you find the sites there. And other scholars like Elena have been working on other, uh, other places within Sichuan. Um, about the, 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 the invisible churches that you mentioned, uh, that is true. That's something that has to be integrated, but we will find a way also to include them. Um, and of course, we talk about sites like material sites, um, um, but we, but that, that's something that belongs to the scholars dealing with Christianity. So, and, then, and, and we have archives. I think Lars gave us um, the, 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 the um, data of particular archives. And we, in, in the case of Lars, that archive can be considered an important site. We, we can, if you scroll down, there is an explanation when we try to make sense of um, the different religious affiliation and the way that we work on the map. Elena, do you wanna join? Yeah, thank you. So I can also ask my questions too. Uh, okay. This is uh, uh, great to actually see, uh, to hear uh, from our own uh, uh, group members what they're working on because we don't often get the chance to actually share this research with each other. So it's wonderful really. Um, uh, in terms of the sites, I think that the map, I think that's what, you know, Stefania said is, uh, I mean, it, it is what we're doing. We're first and foremost uh, detailing uh, the sites that uh, our group is uh, is studying. And so uh, it's not, a com it's definitely not comprehensive. Um, and it involves, it includes places that are still there, places that are no longer there. Uh, sites that have changed, as Stefania said, have changed a religious affiliation. Uh, sites that never had a sp very specific religious affiliation. Um, so um, it is very peculiar to our project and to the people that uh, participate in our project. And the plan is, I think, hopefully, to continue and add more sites um, and so that it can be a little more comprehensive, but we're not trying to do a comprehensive study of everything that's going on in religion in Sichuan, as, as Stefania really mentioned at the beginning. And then, of course, the question of underground churches is more specific to Christianity. And, and I think, again, yeah, we need to deal with that. I also wanted, since... Um, I, I had my hand up before to ask uh, another question, to, to comment and ask, a, or, or really to, to add a comment. One is actually um, a, a little bit of a response to Andrea's question about terminology. And, and I wanted to add a couple of things that I, I, even though, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, Western terms are inadequate is completely true. And that's what Stefania was, was explaining at the beginning. We're really struggling uh, with terminology to define uh, really the interaction of these uh, religious practices and religious modalities. Um, so that's definitely the case, but also in Chinese, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's I think uh, there's a struggle there too. Um, Apart from the five religious traditions, um, what are we talking about? You know, uh, is it Doyang Tsun Jia or is it is it is it Mingjian Tsun Jia? You know, a lot of all of these things that we talk about that are outside of the five traditions is all Mingjian Tsun Jia. Uh, of course, in the past it, they have been defined negatively as well, so Xie Jiao. Right, and so I think in Chinese too, we have a lot of terms for these practices that are not definable very specifically within these categories. 
and and the Chinese, uh, you know, Hu Jiacheng can tell us more, but I think in Chinese, it, it's really hard also to define these practices outside of, and often we define them negatively, uh, or or we kind of put them to the side as, oh, this is just Min Jian Zong Jiao, and we, you know, are not really interested in that, and or it's not really important. So I think the definitions are are difficult in English or in Western languages as much as in Chinese, um, and we need to have more conversations about that too. Um, and then the third thing, if I can add a thing, which was the reason why I, I, I put my hand up, was um, I'm so happy that Stefania is working on monks, temple, and uh, temples, and, and the army in the Second Sino-Japanese War because actually um, I'm working on that too, and we haven't talked about it really. <laughs> and so, uh, but but for another uh, for another temple that the, the one that I'm talking about on on, on February 19th, which also has to, you know I, I try to describe the, the really the real connections between religious institutions or religious groups and the army uh, and how that's uh, really interconnected, especially in this special period from 37 to 45, when, as you said, a lot of the army does come to Sichuan and really kind of changes the, the religious nature of Sichuan in many, many ways. And we have so many examples of that on Qin Chen Shan, there's all sorts of steles by important army uh, generals. And, and in the temple that I'm looking at also, there's you know, steles by important local uh, army members. So I think this area is really, really important to look at. Uh, so that's, uh, and it's not really a question for Stefani. I just wanted to say, um, you know, that's great that you're working on that too. And, and I hope that more people work on that. Um, and that, and I'm sure for Christianity, I, I don't know if it's the same for Christianity, but or for Islam, but certainly for Taoism and Buddhism is very, very uh, similar, I think. Christianity, they were organizing the rescue team training as well, and there were a number of organizations from um, a more local tradition, so uh, again, non-Buddhist and non-Christian, um, but more Taoist. Um, that are studied by a scholar in Hong Kong. Uh, so that is also interesting. But when I remember when I was in Sichuan, I was um, doing research on that. Many monks told me that it was very good for temples um, to host the army because it was a way to make the temple survive. Um, because otherwise, you know, you need the land, you don't, you don't need the building. So many temples survived because they actually they hosted the army and or public offices. And that's the other question that I think is important. Is it that they wanted to support the army or is it that they had to support the army in that period of time? I think that's a really important distinction. Uh, what I find in my research is more that the army kind of took over rather than the other way around. Uh, in your case, it seems like the monks were seen to be very happy to support um, them. Maybe well, that's some of them, I think they felt compelled. Uh, other actually wrote a number of poems um, they were monks that decided to disrobe in order to join the army. And then they found in the archives in Chongqing, they said they prefer leave or they prefer to leave Buddhism because they didn't find it was suitable. Mm -hmm. So there were monks that actually joined the army on the front line, but there are other monks that prefer to, um, to disrobe and then give all their goods to, um, to the army and actually join uh, the battlefield. Um, and some of them seems to be very patriotic, but others uh, were probably feeling that it was important for the survival of their own community. So it's a kind of tricky um, mix of feelings and, and reasons over there. Yeah. From the Christian side, uh, in the same period, you had a, a non-military patriotic response. So basically they were trying, also the foreign missionaries, but as I said, there were not that many perhaps during the war, yes, more than normally, but um, not as uh, many as in other provinces or cities. Uh, but what you got was uh, a um, the attempt to work as doctors, to work in emergency rescue operations, um, certainly to help with the um, aftermath of bombings and so on. And um, uh, after all, some of the um, um, colleges that existed were actually founded by missionaries in, initially, and by that time, they were almost completely run by, uh, by uh, volunteers or people who were paid very little, um, who were Christians, lo local Christians. <clears throat> yeah, you have a question? Yeah, Yuan. Yeah, 
yeah, I do have two questions. Yeah, uh, but thanks very much for the nice speech. And then, um, um, by the way, I, I want to mention because for my undergrad um, research, I do a um, Norwegian missionary whose name is uh, Ludwig Heitschett, who is, has a very liberal theology idea to combine the Buddhism and the Christianity. So he always went went to okay went to visit the Buddhist temples in Sichuan province and also went through the Sichuan to Xikang and Tibet and Yunnan province. So it's a very kind uh, interesting case to combine these two speech. So um, I have two questions. Though the first one is for you, <laughs> for Stephanie. So uh, you do mention the the military is a soldier, the a soldier and the Buddhism. Uh, and I find you in your photo. Uh, I can find the propaganda and the slogan, right? To uh, to commemorate the um, the Second Sino-Japanese War. And um, I what I want to ask is um, for this event, uh, how the temple and how the monks, even the government, to retell the story, retell the story and pick up the certain events or certain things from the history to support this event um, because I really want to know how they uh, re how do you say uh, re narrated they, uh, their history and their historical interaction with the army okay uh, my second question is for Lars and so uh, you mentioned those um, if I remember correctly, maybe the, the Christian, uh, Christians in 19th 19th centuries or 18th centuries, right? Um, so this case re really reminds me the um, those Catholics in Japan, you know, those secret secret Christians, they try to um, hide themselves and develop the underground churches because the um, the policy of the shogun government. So um, what I want to ask is, do you have any sort of when those French missionaries went back to this place and visited the, visit those um, Christian, Christians or secret Christians, um, how do they react and how they understand each other and how they think about each other? Do they question their identity or religious identity or they just when there, the French missionaries just went there and support those community, or what happened to those um, interaction? Basically, I want to I want to ask. So, that's Steph, my. Do you want to ask, uh, answer first, or go? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> the the French had French missionaries had one advantage um, that was that their core area in the um, early 19th century, um, except for um, the northern part of what is nowadays uh, Vietnam, um, was actually relatively open to them. And they could, um, th they could go through the forest and um, uh, arrive in the southern parts of, uh, uh, well, Guizhou, for example, and, but then also further, Yunnan, but then also further up into, um, into Sichuan, where they had these old connections. And um, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, th there's a lot of evidence that suggests that these connections were ongoing, but very, very few. So these are ju just a handful of uh, Western missionaries. Uh, also, the situation in uh, the Qing is not quite the same as during the um, uh, Tokugawa period, Dochuan, in, um, in Japan, because Christianity itself is not illegal. It's uh, since uh, 1724, since the Yongzhong uh, uh, edict, um, missionary activity is illegal, but not Christianity. So you could, as long as you um, even, you could even have a church and the church, if it was registered, fine. But, but as, as I found out when looking at the uh, archives um, in, in Baxian and uh, uh, Nanbu, uh, many of these churches uh, were, were simply places where people congregated uh, without having any official uh, status uh, because they didn't want to involve the, uh, you know, the uh, the, uh, the, the ma magistrate or others. Um, it, but there were no widespread persecutions except for the years 
between 1811 and 1815, there, there were several uh, uh, cases where Christians were killed. But why? Because this is a period when the whole uh, of uh, this stretch of China is in uproar and you have uh, so many uh, armed rebellions um, by religious movements. So the, 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 the Chinese officials, they were not, um, they did not distinguish very clearly between what kind of uh, uh, you had in front of you. Um, and in some cases, um, there were very drastic, very specifically Chinese, sorry, Christian, anti-Christian um, actions. Uh, so where they had to walk across the, the, the crucifix, for example. Um, but in most most Christians, they, they simply went underground again, and there were no big repercussions. And when when the Europeans came in larger numbers, then th there were a few cases where where there were disagreements, like old Christians, new Christians. But it was particularly the Protestants who arrived. They they didn't actually recognize it as Christianity at all, because they were prejudiced against Catholicism. <laughs> that, that, that's the that's my um, take on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so very quickly to answer your question about um, how the the kind of reading of history, new reading of history, uh, what, it, what are my findings so far, and looking at a particular Buddhist monastery, Pao Guan Su, Wen Shu Yuan, that have been studied, um, there is an attempt to, that's my impression, to do a kind of search on focus reading of history. So focus on local people and local events. For instance, there was a very, uh, Wang Mingzhan, I think is his name, a, a local general that was from Xintu, 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 um, Xintu so the, the, the district of Xintu and the, the county of Xintu in the Republican period within Chengdu, so very close to Pao Guan Su. And because it was local, it was then, there was a huge funerary, uh, um, state funeral that was made there. And then the coffin arrived and the Buddhists participated and they like to remember that because it's about the war, but it's also because it's about the local, it's about the community. So there is a long, big emphasis on specific figures that were native of Sichuan from the army. And, and, and so how Sichuan, so it's kind of Sichuan reading of the military history. That's one thing. And another thing I think is, is a way to exploit the war, to give publicity to, specific, when it comes to Pao Wan Su, to a temple or to Buddhism. There's a lot of um, emphasis on this Christian uh, general, uh, Feng Yuxian. And the, the idea is not so much that he's an important general, but that he was not really Buddhist. But he loved to stay at Pao Guan Su. He wrote verses for Pao Guan Su. How great. He was very impressed by Buddhism. So that, that's some, another narrative that is developing. Um, and, and these are two interesting points that I noticed in my research. And in terms of that banner, that was there and in September. And I think it was there, especially around the uh, Guo Qingjie. So in the moment of the national holiday on uh, the 1st of October. So around that date, you have that particular banner and then was taken away, but it was not because of one particular uh, day uh, related to the war, but more related to the Guo Qingjie uh, moment that, you know, it's not one day, it's possibly basically two weeks, uh, more or less of activities. But that, that was, and then it's gone. Um, but when it comes to Pao Wan Su, the posters, um, the photo that I show that come from those posters, they are there 24 seven and they've been there for years. And, and there are, and if you go inside, it's just as, as are very much inside, um, that's really at the center, um, the, the, the middle of the, of the monastery. And they're quite huge, uh, very close to the tea house and the restaurant. And I was quite impressed. I started taking photos. I think I was the only one. <laughs> no one actually was looking at those posters and were looking at me taking photos of the posters. Uh, but for me, it was telling something about how they wanted to talk about their participation in war. So on the one hand, this is such one focus reading. But the other hand is at least for my, for the Buddhist temples I'm working on, I kind of try to exploit the world to make a statement about the Buddhist temple or, um, or Buddhism in general. Well, thank you, thank, you. thank you very much, Stefania. I, I've taken over as chair because Andrea's internet connection is lost. Um, but, um, but I want to thank both Stefania and Lars for an absolutely fascinating paper. I think we have to draw things to a close now and it's, we've gone 
uh, sort of 20 minutes at a time. And it's, uh, it's strikes me as an absolutely sort of terrific project and uh, you know, you, you're doing so many different things and the resources that you've collected and the resources mainly the resources that you're making available to such a large public strikes me as uh, so in, you know an incredible achievement so congratulations on that and um, it's a testimony to the interest in your project that we've had so many different people attending um, I think this is the lot this is our third seminar for the for the uh, term um, and um, or for the academic year, I should say, we had one last two, one last term and two this term. So, and I think this was the largest turnout we've had. So, thank you very much again, and um, I'm sure we'll hear from you again in on a future occasion. And can I just before I throw things to a final close, can I please just remind uh, our audience that our next seminar is on the 24th of February, and then we'll have a paper by Shamita Sen on domestic workers in India. It will be less um, historical and more contemporary, but I'm sure it will be very interesting. So please do come along to that. I'll, of course, send a reminder in due course, but um, thank you very much. We hope to see thank you, you, Wayne. Thank you. And I also wanna thank Elena, who is co-director of the project with me, and. Um, also, SOAS graduate from History and Religious Studies, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Happy New Year. Thank you, Lars. <laughs> it can only yeah, get better. Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. Ciao. Bye bye, everyone. So, yes. So, there's a recording which I just. Um, well, yes. Um, Lars, can you tell us where the recording will be made available? Uh, yeah, it's at the moment on a cloud, in the cloud. Um, yeah. But um, if people wanted to look at it, I, I, I'll have to send out something. I okay, if you can just think of an intelligent you, place, yes. <laughs> send you a notice of yes. a link to the recording um, if you want to mm -hmm. uh, uh, produce that in your own time. So thank you very much. And yes. we'll see you okay. next time. Yes. Bye -bye. Thanks for hosting us. And um, yes, have a very Good evening, everyone, <laughs> or good morning, <laughs> wherever you are. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao, Steffi. Ciao, Elena, as well, and everyone. Yes, bye-bye. <laughs>